Okay, so uh, I'm going to kick off now. So welcome everybody to uh, the first of two sessions on multiplying utopias. Um, hopefully the, the session description uh, gave a bit of a uh, idea of what we'll be uh, looking to do on this one hour session today and then uh, to our session, which will be at uh, 9 a.m. CET um, uh, tomorrow. And it's essentially, uh, what we're going to be doing is uh, today going through an exposition of a few scenarios of the of a more hopeful future that, that uh, folks have submitted in. And we're uh, just gonna touch briefly on those um, as part of uh, two separate projects that I've uh, been working on myself and Primavera, um, as well as Jennifer uh, Maroney, and uh, I'll let them int uh, introduce themselves in a moment. But uh, what's uh, the threads that are coming together through these two projects are really about um, looking at this notion of uh, interoperable utopias. How do we put these different utopias that, uh, that we can each dream about that maybe incorporate some of the, uh, the different fields that we've each been working in? Uh, and in particular, uh, on Prima Rivera and my side, we've been uh, working in particular around uh, computational law, legal engineering, automated uh, legal uh, applications and, and protocols. Um, and that's that's very much my background. I um, have a background as a lawyer. I have done some uh, research and entrepreneurship uh, from Stanford. And uh, some of the scenarios that we'll be presenting here uh, and in the in the next workshop will have come from an initial workshop we did through uh, the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics a couple of months back. Uh, and uh, some of uh, those were all recorded as well. And we've put the videos up for those on a shared mirror board that we'll be actually using for the second uh, workshop. Uh, which will be much more interactive. Uh, so we'll hope you'll be able to join us for that one as well. Um, and really as part of that, we'll be looking to, again, map out some of these interconnections between these different hopeful futures, uh, as well as particularly focusing in on some of the, uh, the, the legal and policy potential for some of those. And I think that's um, really part of some of the context I wanted to set. Uh, obviously in the current environment, we've got a pandemic a health crisis that folks have been talking about in terms of leading into economic, social, and environmental crises as well. And our response to those from the short to the medium to the long term, I think is gonna require a lot of um, uh, really deep questions about what is truly essential and what is important. And it's really bringing out this common theme of our interdependence. At the same time, right now, we're obviously seeing globally a lot of new reckonings with history uh, and the legacy of these stories that we tell ourselves and that get embedded as systemic power inequalities. Uh, and so, you know, everything from calls to reimagining public safety uh, and having greater local control over those, uh, which interestingly has been you know, brought out pre previously by the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who we'll be referencing uh, throughout our, a lot of this as well. Um, but all how that beyond just public safety, more broader notions of authority and legitimacy uh, and how that ties into the uh, through some of the scenarios that we've been talking about. Um, and so, um, again, these scenarios, are, we're, we're, we're really trying to not just bring in the technical and the legal, but really think about that human piece as well. And I think that's really where Jennifer and her, her community can really bring in this broader understanding around meaning that hopefully can be unfolded uh, from a lot of these you know, fairly technical, legal and technical uh, pieces, um, but that really, weave together when we're thinking about the governance of data and what that means for people, measuring impact and digital currencies and how we do that and what that means for people. Um, and so, um, so I'll leave it at that, but I wanted to hand over to Jennifer just to speak a little bit more about the scheme of things and how that project interrelates in with this thinking about the future of modern utopias. Thanks, Johnny. Hi, everyone. Some of you are here from the scheme of things that have been participating. Uh, nice to see you and nice to meet everybody else. So the scheme of things started as uh, a project I wanted, um, I was asked to do, commissioned to do for Croatia's European Capital of Culture in Rijeka, and the theme was the future of work. And the program was called Dopa Lavoro. It's still gonna happen, or it's happening now. Um, and I wanted to think about, or have others think about what, what can we imagine as a post-work world? And what do we want that to look like? What does that mean to us? And so I invited people using storytelling and to make a film about what kind of stories do we want to tell? Can we imagine 
what this world would be like and starting from first identifying what values you have um, and then building out from there what are the features in society or in our world that we we struggle with that we find problematic and want to change or that don't exist or that need to be fully dismantled like the police system um, or the healthcare system you know things that how do we want that to reflect our values and then to rather than thinking about it from telling a story um, in just the format of, you know, this is what I'd like to change, et cetera, but placing a human perspective in the middle of that, developing a character that walks through this world and trying to see it through their eyes and also to, to try and understand and project uh, human complexities that we're always going to face because we turn drama especially into the world around us that either we create or we have no control over. Meanwhile, we, and, and make that seem like that's the thing that we always have to fight against and it's always gonna be like that. Meanwhile, the drama is going to be there no matter what. So we can change the things that we create and build and, um, and accept that it's never going to be a utopia because that's how we are. There's always going to be something we're going to push to a new limit. So we, um, we, we started to make stories in a very collaborative way by coming together, discussing the issues, discussing what our values are, and that's a bit what we're going to do in terms of identifying the features together, hopefully. And the discussions were really the interesting part in terms of the world building because we might disagree or we might have different approaches. And that's where maybe we can start to see where storytelling and scenarios can really help us understand what exactly we mean when we say, I think we should abolish the police system that we have. And your vision of that might look very different than mine. And so storytelling can really help us with that in world building. And the additional thing with the scheme of things is that we actually make things into a film. Um, and so this also brings in other people into thinking about these worlds, whether they, if they didn't participate from the start, but that they can participate in embodying it as actors or trying to think about how does this get shot um, and filmed and how do we what do we need to convey that there's this thing that doesn't exist or that it works differently? So it's an ongoing project and it's being built out continually. It's very new. Um, so if you want to follow it, let me know and I'll, I'll keep you in the loop. But let's not waste more time here. Tony Primavera, Primavera do you want to say anything? I would just say a few words um, on myself and my approach to this. Um, so I'm a legal researcher, um, but from uh, France in Paris at the CNRS and at uh, Harvard at the Bergman Center. And um, so most of my research looks at the impact and uh, the implications of uh, new technologies such as blockchain and uh, uh, AI. Um, on the legal system and more broadly on governance uh, in, in, at the larger societal scale. And um, so as an academic, I oftentimes found myself kind of stuck uh, in the way in which I can express my, my mindset or my visions uh, because the academic settings require a particular format uh, with a lot of uh, references and substantiation and um, demonstrations and so forth. And, um, and I found this kind of freedom when I started uh, drafting some science fiction, um, basically representing my own research um, in a more speculative version, like how, how the world would look like with this technology or without those technology or how could it improve or what are the issues and, and problems that might emerge from it. And, um, and I think um, we share with Tony uh, this, um, this vision that technology, of course, it's, it's always very easy uh, to criticize technology because technology will always, can always be used for bad things. And if it can, it probably will. 
Uh, but at the same time, it also provides a lot of new opportunities. And um, it's, it's more difficult to present the positive side of technology than to present the negative side when we focus in the existing settings, in the existing world in which we live. Um, and actually presenting a, a utopian version of how technology could actually improve uh, some aspect of society actually requires a more systematic rethinking of the existing uh, social, economic, or political order, which, which, which requires us to really think outside of the current model. And that's how, um, both as an academic and as an artist, um, I, I started like uh, several workshops at uh, the Bachmann Center at Harvard. And uh, the idea was like, let's get researchers to actually describe the world, either the world that they want to see happen or the world that they want to try to avoid seeing, um, so as to give them more freedom to actually explain why they are actually doing the research. And it turned out to be like extremely um, productive and actually helping a lot academics um, to, to better understand also for themselves why they are doing the research and also to better explain it. Um, so that's kind of the background and that's how me and Tony somehow merged into this uh, initiative of Art 2030. Um, so I think now we can, we can start um, explaining at least like from, uh, from a preliminary version, um, what was our intention? So, um, the idea was like the, the, whole, the whole thing started from a call uh, to actually draft a, a, a vision of the future world uh, with uh, decentralized technologies. And that's how we started uh, drafting this story with Tony. And, um, and, then, and then the whole COVID uh, thing happened and somehow the, the story evolved. And, um, and the idea with uh, the, the so Leia's Le world, which is like this, the first stone that we have put for this R2030 uh, endeavor is to illustrate what are the various ways in which one single event could actually uh, modify the trajectory of uh, society. So we actually leverage the, the, the COVID crisis in order to illustrate um, multiple facets of a same world in which different societies or different countries have reacted in a different manner to the same crisis. Um, and so the idea we, in, in that story, we present Leia, which is living in this uh, uh, resilient community that actually embraced technology, which is one of the few in that world that actually um, embraced technology without actually turning technology as a tool of uh, control and regulation and potentially oppression, but rather to enhance the autonomy and the emancipation of those local communities. And uh, so we describe a little bit how Leia's world uh, work um, with this notion of the visible hand as opposed to the invisible hand. And, uh, and then Leia's meets with uh, other students that come from different societies and uh, one, each one of the students represents another approach to the, that, that a society has taken to, to address the COVID crisis. And so one comes from um, a place in which actually the government has used technology in order to um, somehow become extremely authoritarian in order to address the crisis. Um, and another one comes instead from this uh, highly um, neolibertarian country uh, in which actually failure from the state to address the crisis then has led to the private sector to come up and to step in in order to try and solve the problems. And, um, and both of those students came to Leia's community in order to learn from, from, from them. And, um, and the idea with Leia's community was our attempt to illustrate how, um, as opposed to like a, a top-down national approach to resolving the crisis, and as opposed to a bottom-up market-driven approach, um, this society actually has built upon uh, Ostrom's 
uh, notion of polycentricity and common-based governance in order to try and find a third ways, right? And then, so the, the story is of course really sharp, but the idea is like, we, we invited these in order to build the, 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 the building blocks of like multiple possibilities and then trying to invite everyone to just describe their own vision of how a society could have reacted to the crisis, but in a positive, in a negative, or most likely in a uh, both positive and negative manner. Uh, depending on the facets that are uh, identified. So one of the things that we wanted to bring out with that fictional story, uh, again, is this um, from the perspective of a particular individual looking out at, you know, what the world would be like, but trying to touch on these themes that we've, uh, we've all been thinking about from data dignity to cooperative ownership, uh, intellectual property commons, learning, food production, uh, architecture, like these sort of interweaving pieces that we've been trying to thread in. And so um, that's a, a story that uh, will be there for, uh, for folks who are interested in checking out, especially if you're going to be joining for the second session. Uh, we'll be looking to, along with some of the other scenarios, unpack some of these uh, questions about how this could be possible, what are the challenges in, in, in facing that uh, and, and moving towards that. Um, from here on, here on, we're, we're going to just um, touch on a few of these different themes that have been drawn out and, and try and interweave uh, both some of the uh, stories that have been presented from um, the Scheme of Things project, as well as uh, some that have been submitted through F2030. Um, the first area that we, we want to just talk about that comes out from, from some of these utopias is, uh, is education. And uh, this broader notion that I think we've all been seeing of uh, greater authority around what to learn. Um, Jennifer, about it uh, in, a, uh, in advance, you were saying about a lot of the stories around learning in the schoolroom, but uh, sort of lived learning. Um, so did you want to sort of reference some of those, those stories that have come in from, from your side around the education piece? Me? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, actually, there's a few people on the call. So Christopher and Constantine and Joe um, were involved in the last round of workshops that we did virtually. And they developed stories that each had education in it. I guess Constantine's yours is a, a student. And Joe and Christopher, yours are children. Or one is a teenager and one is... Uh, a younger child. Um, I can either give an overview of all of yours or would either of you, any of you like to, to say, because they are a bit different. Just send me a sign if you. Well, I, I can start if you want. Sure. Um, my, my scene or my idea that I created or I have in mind is not um, connected to education. Uh, uh, that much, but it's more about housing. It's about a, uh, um, well, it tries to portray the benefits of a new housing mechanism, a um, new market mechanism for the housing market. Uh, in, in my case, a bidding system where the prices are set by the demand side rather than the supply side um, by the interaction of the bidders. Um, but I'm not that, <clears throat> I don't know so much about the techno technology, uh, but that was our basic idea. And I, I based this on three uh, values. Uh, first being uh, the inc increasing the accessibility of housing, uh, of the housing market. Uh, secondly, um, the uh, breaking down socioeconomic barriers in neighborhoods and between individuals to create a more diverse uh, environment of living. And um, in my story, just to touch upon the plot very quickly, it's a 22 year old student uh, like me, and he moves to Frankfurt uh, to do his master degree or to do his master's. And uh, he finds a place uh, on in this uh, on this new housing platform or in this app that is based on this mechanism 
And uh, that is also the reason why he's uh, able to study in Frankfurt in the first place. And then he um, makes experiences and encounters different people in this uh, diverse environment that has been created through the new housing uh, way, way of distributing housing or property. And uh, these experiences in turn shape his uh, life and uh, in a way educate him as well because they advise him. And so maybe there's the closure of the circle to education again. Um, and I, I'm probably gonna write some more stories and uh, touch upon education as well, because I think that's a very important topic, but that's, that's it for now. And basically it's then, uh, it envisions a more integrative way of uh, living. Thanks, Constantine. Um, Chris do, and or Joe, do you want to quickly, very quickly say, or Joe, just send me a sign and I'll, I'll read, I'll go, Try to explain yours very quickly. But Christopher, do you want to say quick, sh in a very short um, way, how yours deals with education? Hi, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Um, you could frame so it as well, like the, the other recognitions and values. Yeah, yeah, so I, uh, the... Education comes in the story, but my my the kind of backdrop to the world the world that I wanted was I sort of made this uh, underlying assumption that um, there's a sort of mass recognition of the need to consume very little of the Earth's resources and expend very little uh, energy. So that's a kind of it, there's a there's a mode of thought that's sort of sustaining sustaining that, and that's the kind of baseline from which I'm from which I'm working. There's a sort of dynamic but steady state societal survival instinct that's that's where i that's where i was at is it's i imagine it to be kind of pro pragmatic and, and rootsy kind of a bit different different to different to now um it's, it's global and it's varied um and it may be even sort of sustained by some kind of mystical kind, kinds of kinds of thinking so that's that's where i'm i'm operating um the features in that world. I mean, I hadn't really, I haven't really thought it through from a from a sort of implementation point of view. But um, I, I see it to be sort of very simple, maybe as it is now, but but more more modest. Um, there's there's a lot less products and kind of hands-on reuse of things. Uh, much lower use of materials. Um, the widespread deployment of sort of renewable energy technology and so on. Um, that means there's a lot more time. Um, so there's maybe a biological rhythm which sort of matches the night and day and the, and the season. Um, and it, but it's still a very creative world. And I think that's what kind of where the story came from is that it's, it's very creative. There's a lot of invention, there's a lot of scholarship. But the thing is, is that all kinds of large scale technical initiatives, they're, they're, they're assessed, rigorously assessed before before we actually deploy it. So development is managed very differently in this world, I think it's more limited. And so um, it, that led to the to the story, which is sort of in in, in three parts. And in the, in the first part, uh, it's, it's a young lad, I think maybe 14 or 15, Vincent it's called. Um, and he's attending, he's attending secondary school and he's in a class where he's learning about how things are, things are produced. And since he's this sort of serves as a history lesson too, he's learning how in the recent past things were things were also made and how much more wanton and destructive it was. And when he when the boy sort of compares the past and the and the present, he sort of is left with this feeling of frustration. He wonders if we never explored our technological potential. And um, he has this sense he wants to exert some kind of large scale physical influence on the on the world. And so he's he's quite conflicted. Um, and then a, a second part of the story, he he sort of turns to wildness in the end and, and uh, petty vandalism. And he breaks into, I imagine him to be breaking into warehouses with his friends full of uh, consumer relics and um, sort of taking these gadgets and trying to turn them on and so on. And uh, it, they get bored of that, of course. And so, so they uh, maybe use them as projectiles to destroy things and so on and, and in the end they, they burn down a very large large building that's a sort of final final outburst from him um 
and then finally uh, we end up in a, the kitchen the kitchens where we always come to uh, really understand things and he, and he calms down he resumes life at a, a sort of slower pace um, and through a sort of series of conversations with his grandfather he kind of comes to realize that the, the more interesting developmental pathway is, is much more in his head than rather in a, a kind of external an external thing and he accepts the limitations in the in the world and uh and and the, the led into the wildness in the in the first place so that's the uh that's that's my story thanks chris and i'll just quickly read a couple of passages from joe's who's on the call as well um joe imagined uh that Kid, so that's the, the child's name is Kid. He lives in a small urban village, one of thousands uh, inside Chicagoland with millions of other people set in the near future. He goes to school in the morning, works in the afternoon, and mingles with neighbors in the evening. Um, people in the village meet and get to know one another through repetitive interactions and events. Traveling is a way of communicating with the shared world as Kid interacts with family, neighbors, other villages, the countryside, and the global metropolis. Kid's family lives on one floor from uh, one floor down from the elevator entrance into their five-story village. So a building is a village, which is located 53 stories above the ground. Or uh, a floor is a village, and there are many villages in this building. There's a cafe at the elevator entrance and two classrooms, another level down from their house. The top floor of their village includes a high-tech factory, huge greenhouses fill the south-facing facade of the, bu the building. Kid pieces together a worldview from experiences each day of the week. In seven days, Kid is learning about different uh, seven boundaries of human activity. And we meet him on the Sunday morning at home before an adventure into the city. I'll quickly say, so you get that he, every day he has, so Joe set this out where it's seven days a week. Um, and each day you see, you get an understanding of what he eats and where he goes. Like it said, he comes to some kind of boundary. And on Friday, it says, dad made pancakes on Friday morning, which gives me the energy to dive into my science lessons. 60 students, teachers, and tutors help us do experiments about, about our airport. Students are testing all kinds of things like water quality, air quality, etc. My group of seven students and one tutor learned from Mr. Dostoevsky in the laboratory, laboratory overlooking the plaza. He's responsible for verifying the cleanliness of the transportation system after UV light cleaning. We learn about chemistry and biology and how molecules move. And we have to test the actual transportation system, which is great because we learn about our city. Plus we get to have lunch at my favorite barbecue place, two cities away, which only takes 10 minutes on our new fast learning rides. So the story goes on. Um, but so it's this very interactive life on you know, hands-on learning and changing uh, daily. Wow. So the, that is also a bit the theme in a lot of the other stories that came from the scheme of things. No, that's that's really beautiful. I I love the the, the vividness of those images. Uh, thank you to all of you. And the 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 this one scenario that uh, we had from from our side that came out from some of the discussion, uh, the first session we had in our previous workshop around COVID-19 was, uh, it's related to a public health education uh, platform called uh, nextgenu.org. Uh, and so Miriam, who's the uh, co-founder of that, she, she will be able to join us for the second session, not for this one, but I'll just touch on the scenario. And it's based on this actual platform, that the, which is a open source, uh, global, uh, open education, platform uh, for distance learning around public health uh, matters and it's the first one that can offer these certified degrees and they've built up this sort of partnership of uh, medical institutions all around the world but the beautiful thing about it is that it is this learning commons around public health uh, in 90 plus countries. Uh, Miriam is a nurse herself and she uh, her story is from the perspective of a nurse learning uh, in the future but uh, very much with the hope of what their platform, their open source platform can look like in 10 years in the future. Um, and I think that's, that's very much part of that, uh, I think, hopeful framework for a self-directed learning that we, 
we, we touch on in, in their story and I think comes out in some of these other stories as well. Um, but then, of course, one of those underlying um, threads around how we can have self-directed learning is this, and I'm just going on to this next theme now, around data dignity and data governance. Um, <clears throat> certainly in, the, in, in Leia's world, the, the reason that the learning commons uh, can be a thing is that there's this underlying uh, piece that we've sort of referenced around data trusts, or at least trusted uh, institutions that are much more benevolent intermediaries in a sense, and the, the, this broader hope for a future in which we're uh, along the lines of I think some of the other uh, discussions are just much more in control of that. Uh, Jen, Jennifer, you've uh, referenced that there were some stories on data cooperatives on this notion of a much more participatory data economy and uh, how that, again, can potentially be the basis for new local services, new kinds of asset ownership, uh, which will next theme, and I want to bring in Brian and to talk about his sort of shared asset ownership piece there. But just for the moment, as we think about this data piece, um, I wonder if you wanted to introduce some of the scenarios that specifically were talking about data dignity and that, that aspect. Yeah. yeah, so in one of the stories in Rieka, actually the whole kind of world is, is a bit combined, we did it together, but in that um, place, so there's, I guess you could say there's a UBI. The, the basis for that story was that there was economic security for everyone um, and trying to show like the ways that, that feed into that stability or that reduce costs. So there's this girl, Emma, that arrives and she has some other issues going on, um, personal ones from the work that she used to do, which involve uh, the military and which has been demilitarized. Um, and she she's getting set up. So we get to see a bit about the world in which she's moving into. And there's uh, a lots of cooperatives, data cooperatives that she can join. So we see her at one point, um, she goes to this welcome center and she gets this chip for her healthcare and that's all as well free. And, you know, there's an exchange of data. Um, and she also is testing out some machine learning data cooperatives. So there's one with a hand motion uh, where she can train whatever she, it is that she needs to train. Um, and then she receives bank statements and things like statements of her income basically from, from these, but also the data through the healthcare system uh, just helps reduce the cost. And there's, so it's hard, it's hard to show this um, in film, but, and a lot of, I think you are a specialist in maybe how this could be implemented. Um, but that's that's basically the the part of the world regarding data. It's like everything that you do, uh, you have control over it as well. In terms of you can say whether you want to share it. Um, it's not big corporations like we have now. Just much more data cooperatives and pretty linked to the services that you need and things that are valuable. Fantastic, and 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 I think the 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 two pieces that I just want to reference uh, from the Earth twenty thirty side is that we have um, on the sort of more uh, individual uh, sort of perspective, looking at what's being asked of us right now. Uh, the first session that we had, and there's the video uh, we'll be sharing around with people who are able to send session two that covers some of this, was on uh, contact tracing privacy principles in relation to contact tracing, interoperability around that. And I think this is one of the uh, foremost implement sort of pieces that we're seeing happening right now that could set up to Primavera's points, these, these very divergent country approaches to how data may be handled on this broader basis. Related to that is the uh, fact that the, in California, uh, as of uh, this coming two weeks, so on the 1st of July, the California Consumer Privacy Act will be coming into place. Uh, and there is essentially legislation that allows for something known as an authorized agent to be able to act on your behalf to tell data brokers to not sell your data. Uh, and again, from the policymaker side of thing, from the lawyer side of thing, trying to tell the stories of the impact of this um, is a challenge. 
Uh, and uh, we haven't got a scenario specifically submitted around that, but we've been working with various organizations who are trying to push the boundaries. And there's a, a broad community of legal hackers who are uh, globally organizing around how to go uh, taking something like the California Consumer Privacy Act, taking things like privacy principles for contact tracing. Uh, and I'd like to direct you all to edu uh, for uh, some materials about uh, these privacy principles around that, but which again are seeking to, in an open source way, make these uh, narratives of what is happening right now available to policymakers. But again, look forwards 10 years in the future uh, for how that relates. The second more global perspective, rather than on the individual perspective, is the climate side and how data dignity and data governance in relation to climate uh, can support these larger coordinations between, between countries as well. Uh, and so I'll reference again the video at the, the Stanford sessions. Uh, we had a few scenarios where people were presenting these uh, 10 years in the future where climate data policy really, really did use digital currencies and there were new measures of impact and value flow and where the rights of people who were most affected by climate issues were really being listened to and heard. Uh, we had one particular individual who had uh, been working for Jerry Brown's Strategic Growth Council and had specifically gone out into the community to canvas the voices of some of these uh, individuals who had previously been left out of the whole discussion around climate change and where some of the funds from carbon taxes might be deployed. And so those kinds of stories, I think, again, as part of this hopefully being a more ongoing creation of a storytelling commons, uh, we'd love to elevate for all of the other storytellers in this, uh, in this community to be able to pick out and really tell some of those broader stories about data that really impact upon these broader collective issues. Um, with that, I want to turn over to Brian Wilson, actually, at this point, because uh, I mentioned that data part that can allow for uh, this, this notion of economic security, community ownership. Um, Brian Wilson uh, is actually the editor-in-chief of, of law.mrt.edu, the computational law report. Um, again, we've been trying to gather some of the tools, uh, not necessarily as many of the stories so far, uh, but Brian uh, did the uh, sterling effort of trying to put together a story related to one of the specific pieces of computational law that he's actually working on. So Brian, can you give us a bit of an overview of, of that story and the, and the project itself? Sure. So I'm going to go out of order and do the, uh, the project and, and then show how it kind of fits into the, the, the bigger picture of the, of the scenario. But basically... I've started working with uh, the Kauffman Foundation and a few others to kind of start designing some of these building blocks that can be used to improve equity in a bunch of different contexts. Um, so some of those contexts are obviously economic. Um, you can look at something like rent as kind of this atom of what transactions are and how we kind of share value with one another, how we create value, how we understand um, and represent the values of societies and communities. Um, and then there are also the non-economic values. So you look at um, things like biodiversity, you look at um, kind of local resilience, uh, and, and, and you can start to understand that it's not all financial. It's not this way that we've been dealing with it um, since the industrial age. And so the scenario was really about imagining what this looks like in 10 years. And so, you know, one of the things that is kind of driven home is that there's this use of an app that allows people to kind of vote on some of these things that they want um, because uh, you know the interests of a community they change and they vary based on different uh, different changes and circumstances that happen all around them you know the idea of communities governing themselves and communities creating these means of an exchange uh, a lot of people have thought about that as sort of the static thing, this fixed thing. But, uh, you know, with the kind of idea of like emergent leadership, we're really seeing that it's more of a verb. And so, you know, coming up with a way that people can actually represent their interests, that they can vote on things, that they can actually kind of govern their community more collaboratively and get invested is something that um, it, it, I try to kind of drive home in the, in the scenario that... Uh, uh, we came up with and then um, you know really getting to this idea of um, you know having structures having communities that are generative that are restorative restorative and that are biologic um, and, and to give you an idea of kind of the direction of where some of this is heading um, we're, we're working on a pilot right now 
um, that involves the finance of, a, of an apartment building. And so the building itself is going to have a bunch of investors put in um, several million dollars to construct it. And then over time, instead of paying rent, tenants actually buy fractional ownership rights in the building. And so the ownership of the building gradually offsets to where the community owns um, a substantial chunk of the building and has this whole new set of incentives that allow them to you know, borrow against you know, this asset that they partially own. They can um, you know, have greater access to capital. Uh, the investors themselves also have faster return on investment for the money that they put into constructing the building. And so we're really trying to you know, look at this one use case as kind of like the, that atomic unit that you know, rental transaction is the first building block and get towards this larger idea of, okay, you know, what does it look like if we try and, you know, not only have the rent, uh, or not only have this, you know, payment for the apartment building uh, for the fractional ownership right be based on, you know, getting that asset. What if we also tied it to some uh, metric that is related to the net increase or net decrease in the the environmental health of the, that is output by the building as well. And so, um, it's a lot of fun and I think it really touches nicely with some of the themes that had been mentioned earlier as well. Thanks, Brian. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the most exciting pieces about this is that it's actually a project that you have got funding to roll out and do a pilot around and potentially be the building block for this kind of local decision-making data uh, ownership that as Jennifer was saying, feeds into notions of economic security based on these different building blocks to improve equity. Um, Primavera, I, I, uh, I don't know if you wanted to just kind of offer some of the things that you've been thinking about when it comes to why, I guess, the infrastructures that we've been digging into on both the technical and legal side make some of these community ownership frameworks more possible now, uh, in a sense. Um, or some of the challenges maybe, or, I mean, obviously we'll be able to dig into these on the second, but I'm conscious that we've been leaving you out of the convo. <laughs> no, no, I mean, don't talk about that. I, I think it's actually, uh, for this session, I think it's more interesting to, to discuss like, what are the, like there's still a, a few things to discuss, but what are the various um, visions that, are, that have been presented? And then uh, I think tomorrow is more about like how, do we actually get practical and what are the tools that we have and what are the tools that we're lacking in order to try and implement those uh, vision? Fantastic. Well, I mean, to that point then, if anybody uh, who's, on, who's on at the moment has any comments, please feel free to leave them in the chat and we'll obviously take those into the second session, whether it's tools or, or questions or uh, the like. Uh, if we can't get them to, to them today in, in, in this session right now. Um, sticking with community ownership then, I, I just want to reference something that Prima Vera and I are both involved with, uh, which uh, is uh, around decentralized funding. So one of the issues with the uh, current status of uh, the funding world, uh, well, one of the issues that ties to this notion of equity is that um, the, the diversity of uh, venture capital uh, and the nature of venture capital and, and what that goes towards funding. Uh, something like 75% of venture capital money currently goes towards software. Uh, and uh, there's sort of like minuscule amounts that go towards transportation, sanitation, healthcare, all of these things that potentially we've suddenly realized have, are, are essential or key. Um, and a different approach maybe to have different people making the decisions around where funding goes. And so uh, one of the projects that Primavera are both involved with is uh, based in Asia. It's called the Impact Collective. Um, and uh, some information about that on the mirror board as well that we'll be sharing. Um, but interestingly, the, the thing that really brought home to me why this, I think, could be a, a real part of this hopeful future is this notion of how storytelling and the act of storytelling as part of generating funds and as part of actually sharing what uh, they've termed an appreciation token. So this is an appreciation, both in terms of the, the carry 
uh, of the fund itself that uh, different storytellers and different community members are able to participate in through the distribution by the software startup themselves, or no, sorry, not the software startup, the, the impact related startup themselves. Um, Primavera, you're actually more involved in designing that whole governance mechanism. I don't know if you wanted to touch on anything from that particular project itself that, that stands out around that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, um, it's like one way of, I mean, it, again, it, it's like technology and uh, how technology can be used for good and evil. And, um, you know, we have like um, technologies like blockchain and uh, tokenization and so forth that um, came and presented those um, very positive vision about how we could actually decentralize funding, how we can actually create a system in which contributors get assigned a particular level of uh, either economic rewards or reputation tokens and therefore get more influence into the project. Like a lot of very, very beautiful um, visions of like decentralization, but more, more than just decentralization, more like based governance into those projects uh, and so the technology is there and the vision is there and uh, unfortunately we have not seen much of those visions actually being implemented in practice and quite to the opposite uh, if we look at what somehow flourished in the last years uh, it's a very different it's the same technology but being used in very different ways um, whether we see it like with the ICOs and, and other types of like speculative um, platforms and so the, the question then is, and it goes back, of course, to governance is how do we actually, it's not just about what technological tools do we have, but it's mostly actually about, I mean, the technology is perhaps a precondition for creating a new opportunities, but then what really needs to be assessed is what is the governance of uh, those technology and how do we actually create a governance structure that will promote a more common based governance as opposed to just fading or deriving into this more market-based approach. Um, and so in, in, in this sense, I think like the narratives are important, but um, narratives actually are not sufficient because it's actually easy to take a very beautiful narrative and co-opt it in order to actually create a tool or a platform that is actually not at all um, living, abiding by those values. And, um, and so I think we need like the narrative is like the technology is a precondition. The narrative is what actually aspire, inspire people to actually eat, experiment with this technology. But then we also need to think about practically and pragmatically, given this vision and given the technology that we have, how do we actually proceed from there? And, and there is like increasingly a uh, new project and new platform that are trying to implement those visions. Um, and I think, to, in my view, like we need to work both uh, on fostering this vision to the maximum so that we can counter uh, the current derive um, of this technology and then trying to understand how each one of us, um, either by joining a project or by creating a new project or just somehow like building towards this direction, uh, can we promote uses of the technology or uses of those new opportunities that are arising um, that, that we make sure that they are actually going in that, in that direction. Brilliant. <clears throat> so um, I want to move on to our last theme and it's sort of like a group set of themes um, for, for, for want of time, but uh, this sort of encompasses the post-work universal basic income public infrastructure sort of thread. Um, and so Jennifer, you have some scenarios uh, to just introduce about economic security and energy as well. Yeah, so um, again, in the stories uh, for Rieka, the house that Emma moves into, well, one, there's, there's like a licensed a sort of salsa application of the home ownership structure um, where the the license, the tax of it goes to the community. So the the rent is actually lower or it enables people to be able to access housing better. So she moves into this house that is an apartment and it turns out that her apartment building is one of the ones that 
as a solar energy sharing system. Um, so this is another form of her uh, both reducing the costs of energy dependence in general. So I based it off of a company that actually exists that is called SoulShare and they're in Bangladesh. Um, and basically everybody already had solar panels. They were pr produced locally, but the energy just got wasted. So they made this um, box that people could trade or transact uh, electrons essentially energy um, among themselves. And so that was a little bit of an influence as well as also being able to fit back into the grid of a structure like ours um, so that we just don't lose energy. And I pulled in a bit of an idea from the town that we live in, uh, in Magdeburg in Germany. And there's a local, Christopher could tell you more about this, but there's a, a local um, windmill, wind turbine that produces, I think, more than the energy that we need as a town. Is that correct? Chris? Correct. Okay. And um, so things like that. One wind, one wind when, turbine. When, when, when the wind is blowing. <laughs> <laughs> so trying to pull in things like that. Exactly the specific technical details of it don't feature in the story, but you get that sense. Um, and that people, one other thing is that people, they they work like there are things to do it's just not the same type of work that we're used to doing actually with covid we're not really used to doing it anymore people uh spend time on the things that they want to do they find important um again like imagine if you had a stimulus check or something how would you that you can count on every month how would you spend your time and people in the story are more um, taking care of each other and not spending so much time on earning money to buy things that basically are more status symbols or to kind of keep themselves busy in times of boredom on their way to work that they don't want to do. Um, but, but they take care of each other. There's a lot of intergenerational um, existence and closeness in that way and so I guess in some ways that the, the story is less dependent on, on so much uh, financial um, funding going to things to hire people to do things because people have more time and they can participate in that way. I, I, I love those vignettes, Jennifer, and um, Leo just on the chat has made a really interesting point, which I think plays into this, which is that when we have these vignettes, uh, even if they an imagination that can be applied in a different context, I think those vignettes and those features, as we've been saying, sort of really hold true. And so I think um, just uh, looking now towards the top of the hour where we've got a uh, uh, close out, but hoping that uh, some or all of you will be able to join for the second session where we'll really be able to try and pull out some of these features and some of these differences of uh, vignettes, feelings, emotions, images. Um, what I will do is I'm going to share in the chat, and I think you'll all get, get it uh, uh, through an email, but I'm going to share a, a Miro. A Miro is uh, basically a shared one uh, that we can all use, uh, mm -hmm. and we're just putting up the uh, on that board uh, for you to go out and uh, add any images, questions, challenges. It's a completely open, everybody has free edit access, so please don't go in there and delete everything you're feeling particularly troll-like. Um, <laughs> but uh, there, yeah, that's essentially where we'll be uh, for 12 hours, 11 hours or so. <laughs> yeah. And are we, so, we'll um, share... We'll share a link to the stories that there are so far, right? To a folder. Yeah. What I've been doing, the story is actually embedded in the mm -hmm. board. So we have lots of things with folks. Okay. So there and uh, folks who've had pop in there, uh, and we can just sing doing that. Um, but uh, but thank you everyone for coming, uh, and I uh, hope to see you at the the next session. I just wanted to check whether Primavera.
Jennifer, you, you guys wanted to add anything before we, we wrap up? Um, no, I hope uh, this, you know, we tried to consolidate a lot in a very short amount of time and uh, hopefully we can just dig in next time and try and get to a little bit deeper into these things, these, uh, this world. And thanks everyone. Primavera, do you wanna? Yeah, no, I just, uh, yeah, I would strongly invite everyone that was in this session to come to the next one because um, it's, it's actually, it's gonna be like the follow-up of like, given those different vision, different, those different aspects, how do we materialize? And if any one of, uh, of you have any idea or anything that they want to share as to like, how we can actually get closer to that, uh, please come and uh, it will be a much more interactive session. Yeah. I've got a question. Yeah. It will be 3 a.m. in the morning uh, for that session, so I won't be able to make it, but will it be recorded? Yes. This one has been recorded and that one will be as well, so we'll send it to you. Great. Brendan, feel free to hop into the mirror board if there are things from your experience and background that, that make sense. And oh, sure. Yeah, there's, there's the several things I'll jump in. Well. Great. Great to see you, Brenda. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. See you at the next session.